All right. What is up, my friends? Definitely the first take of this, of course. Definitely not the second <laughs> take. I want to welcome uh, Autumn Burchett to the stream, our special guest here on Mod Monday. Two-time English national champion, first Mythic Invitational champion. Of course, super fresh off Zendikar Rising finals happened less than, what, like 12 hours ago, 24 hours ago? Hmm. Autumn, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on to Mog Monday. Um, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing well, yeah. It's good to be here. As you absolutely don't know, I actually watch a fair bit of Mog Monday, so... Yeah, so as I was saying, let's get, get some cross fandom here. We're, we're kind of redoing the intro here. I did this, but that's okay. They don't know that. So um, a little cross fandom here. Um, of course, I'm a big fan of Autumn. One of my, my favorite players. Autumn watching Mog Monday. That's pretty great, too. We have some guests here, too. Well, I guess come say hi. Sure. We got John. John and Nicole are watching Autumn play as well. Because, John. Hey. Well, who's your favorite <laughs> magic player? And who's your second favorite? <laughs> well, thank you. But... Wow. <laughs> who's your favorite magic player who doesn't live in this house? <laughs> Autumn! <laughs> Thank you. The mono blue, was that Mythic Championship 1? Is that what it was called then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The mono blue one? Yes. So we had the pleasure of meeting Autumn after that, right? So um, at PAX. PAX East. PAX East, yep. So that Briefly. was fantastic. Mm. But John wants to kick things off. He has a question for Autumn. John has a question. All right, question from the audience. Awesome. Come closer. So, how much tournaments have you won in your career? <laughs> uh, oh my gosh, that's a hard thing to count. I I used to play like a lot of local tournaments when back when I lived in London. So it might be like fifteen or something, including all of those. Two-time so. national champion, Mythic champion. Mm -hmm. champion. Cool. Cool. Sweet. <laughs> well, thank you for my, my, my guest questions here, of course, okay. popping in. And um, cool. So what, let's talk about this recent tournament. So obviously yesterday we're like 12 hours off of the Zendikar Rising Championship. Um, let's talk about it for a bit. You played Goblins and Historic, of course, obviously Mog Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, Gruel and Standard. And you work with Emma. Who else do you work with? Um, what made you choose the decks? And uh, fire away. Oh, there's so I, I have to open up a list of the people on the, the team set. I'm going to forget some people otherwise. Uh, so the full team was 11 people. It was myself, Emma, Jestefan, uh, Matt Sperling, Canister, Chris Kavartek, Sebastian Pozzo, Leverato, uh, JMM, High Banana Fish, and Luis Salvato. We so it was a big, big team. <laughs> the, the biggest team I've been on in like years. I'm like normally I work with like one or two people um, and like having like a really small squad just because yeah. it makes it really easy to I find once you get on a big team you end up like lots of information gets lost because like you know one person will talk to like the couple people they did the testing games with but won't necessarily pass on everything sure, very indeed. effectively the, the logistics uh, of actually like conveying the information to everyone definitely gets difficult if you have someone who's like kind of like ringleadering everything yeah. uh but it actually went really well for this. We we had a Discord group set up. Basically, whenever anyone was playing a deck or whatever, they would post their feedback and thoughts on it. Um, we would have people doing testing online and being in calls with each other. And anyone who wanted to come like spectate the games, they would just be streamed to the Discord. So you'd just have like a couple people dropping in and spectating what was going on whilst other people were doing dedicated testing against each other. Mm. And that meant like there were just lots of lots of feedback on everything that was going on. It was very effective. Sweet. Yeah. That reminds me a little more of like almost like old school like team testing where like back, mm -hmm. you know, years ago, you know, back in the days of the Pro Tour, you know, or my day or whatever, you know, um, <laughs> you know, it, it was very about teams. You know, you had this team and that team. Teams were, were very secretive and stuff. And it does feel like in the last, you know, few years with the arena and more online stuff that people are kind of working more alone. They're working in small little groups mm -hmm. or they're maybe watching more streams or watching, you know, this and that. And um, it was kind of cool to hear that you had almost like an old school testing team and that it, it worked out effectively. Mm -hmm. what, what were, the yeah, other, were there any, good, any other good finishes in, on the team? Uh, so JMM ended up top baiting, uh, Jan. Uh, we had, I think, two other people top six, two other people lost winning ins for top eight on the team. 
That's so. That, that so that's very very good for like almost an almost two hundred person tournament. That's that's awesome. Yeah, like if that last round breaks a bit, little bit differently, suddenly half the top eight is our team, which is kind of absurd. Yeah, that that would be insane. <laughs> that's that's great. Uh, and then what did everyone play? Did everyone play goblins and gruel? Was there was there like d- dissenting factions among the team as far as what deck to play? Uh, so almost everyone played Gruul. I think mm-hmm. there was like one person on Mardu, one person on something else. Everyone else was on Gruul. And then in Historic, almost everyone played Four Color, mm-hmm. uh, the Yashan deck. But Emma and I but both just really love the Goblins deck and thought it was actually decently positioned at the moment. Um, so I decided to go with that. Sweet. So talking about the list a little bit. So it's funny, in, in a little bit of epic foresight, as I mentioned earlier on stream, um, on Friday, I think it was round two, maybe round two or whatever, your list are posted. And I was like, oh, wow, Autumn and Emma are playing a really cool Goblin list. I'll, I'll play it for my, my Cool Stuff video on Monday. Hopefully they do well. And yes, go Autumn. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so what's really cool about the list is the main deck Herald Horns. So we have main deck Herald Horns, mm-hmm. main deck Mind Stones. Of course, Herald Horns, a card usually seen in the sideboard as a three or four of, a card that I'm super fond of. And then Mind Stone we've seen in and out a little bit. So why Mind Stone? Why Herald's Horn? Talk a little bit about, about the deck and the choices. So Herald's Horn, I expected Four Color and Soul Tide combined to just be the most popular deck. Um, and I felt like Herald's Horn was basically the best card you could main deck against them. And it's also really nice from the perspective of it isn't great in the matchups where you have to be hyper linear. But ultimately, it's still another cost reduction thing. It's still another thing that gets you to your Muxus. Like, it's like the first thing you bought out, but it's not awful. You're, sure. you're fine to draw it. It will do its job. And then when you draw it against Soltai game one, it's just backbreaking. Yeah. It's, um, the, the, the effect of just like, they can't really remove it. And it just keeps going as the game goes on is amazing. Mm-hmm. We, we just watched your matches. We watched the finals match. And one of the big things in the finals match was that Brad was able to cast out the the herald horns yeah Brad actually had an answer and multiple answers over multiple turns for the herald horns which is pretty huge mm-hmm. yeah that's a big difference between the blue white matchup and the euro decks is the euro decks typically have at most two answers to herald horn whereas blue white deck has four cast out and four to ferry yeah. so it's a lot harder to protect it uh i like, if Blue-White was to become really popular, I'd probably re- lead in, lean into ring meters a bit more. Mm-hmm. I think they're quite a bit better against those cards. Um, the reason for Mind Stones is kind of a couple things. Uh, the big one is I bought out two drops a lot. I think Snoop is bad in the linear matchups, and I think Wily Goblin is bad in the interactive matchups, but it's so hard to just be boarding out half your two drops and just have nothing to do on turn two anymore. Mm-hmm. So having a couple of Mind Stones main deck sets you up really well for the sideboarded games because of that. Um, I also just kind of preferred it to a lot of the other flex spots people play to like fill up those final spots in the deck. It's a little bit awkward because it makes colorless mana. For a while, I was trying four copies, mm. and you get in these positions where you have like two Mind Stones in play in a tower, and suddenly you just, e- even though you've got all this mana, you can't do anything with it because this, you have all this double red in your deck. But the first couple copies have felt really good to me. Yeah, it's it's also in concert with the with the Herald's Horn. Maybe you have a Herald's Horn and a War Chief in play, and you actually have no use for colored mm-hmm. mana at all because everything costs red, red. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's really cool because I I I watched you sideboard against uh, the Aura's deck, and you cut the four Snoops, and mm-hmm. that was the only thing that I considered because the the problem I had with Goblins and Historic was that there weren't enough two drops. You know, that you you have games where you just like don't necessarily get off the ground fast enough, and either you get run over or you're not pressuring enough. So the mindset helps to solve that, and then the idea of boarding up mm-hmm. Snoops. Now, board out Snoop makes sense to me. So I guess the more control decks, you, you board out the Wily Goblin instead of Prospector. And in my my logic with, with that was I usually leave in one Prospector and leave the Goblins in because the Goblins at least are material. So if you, you're you ramping, but you see have a 1-1 in play to kind of like poke at Planeswalkers and stuff, whereas Prospector, you don't want to like <laughs> shove all in on a Moxus against a Counterspell. So why why do you like the Prospector over Wily Goblin in a matchup like that? Uh, so against Euro decks, I think it's like a lot more clear-cut 
against blue white i'm kind of unsure on what i'm meant to be doing I, I, against the euro decks i like it i like the prospector more partially because it's an odd cost card mm -hmm. against extinction event um so a lot of the time extinction event is having to hit even either because you have a krenko in play or because you've just resolved a muxus mm -hmm. so the more odd cost goblins you have in your deck the better because of that mm -hmm. um which is like not a very intuitive thing, but I find actually just matters a lot. Uh, the other reason is, I think, partially the ceiling on it is a lot higher, and partially there's like this threat of activation thing, where like a lot of the time, if you have a prospector in play, your opponent on like turn three or four, your opponent still just has to leave up interaction sure. to stop Muxus, just in case. Whereas like. If you have a Wily Goblin in play and like a Matron or whatever and free lands, you're not really threatening Muxus unless you also have a Prospector in hand. So maybe they just tap out and you're not like straining their mana as much. That's Which cool. so against Soltai, they just have so much sorcery speed stuff that straining their mana in those early turns feels really important to me. Cool. So that's like the, the level beyond of what I'm thinking where I'm sort of like, why well, don't want to cycle myself to pass the spell into a counter spell, but the reality mm -hmm. is that, like, that, that what you're saying is that the threat of it is like just having it in play will affect how they play, and maybe you don't yeah. cycle your stuff for the, the thing, but it still makes they have to respect the fact that you can. That's pretty cool. Sweet. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Any fun tales of the event? I got I got to watch the finals. I didn't, I I was like peeking in on the event all weekend, and I didn't get, I didn't get to see all the matches. Any fun stories? Anything cool happen? You know, I'm sure obviously lots of cool things happen. You came in second, but you know any any fun exciting stories? I'm always so bad at this part of interviews. I'm very bad at remembering individual parts of games from tournaments. It all kind of blurs together a little bit. I know I uh, <laughs> Emma joked on Twitter at me at one point that I'd faced like mirror mirror matches against our teammates twice in the tournament, mm. and two owed both of them, <laughs> and, and was just like, "Awesome, you're not meant to cannibalize our teammates." <laughs> and, I guess, I guess that's part of the downside of having a larger team too. Is that if you have eleven yeah. players on a team and a, a tournament of like one hundred and eighty, like it it just has to happen eventually. So, oh, the good news is it means you're all doing well. So, mm -hmm. there's a, you know pluses and minuses there. How did this tournament feel being a totally online tournament versus playing in paper tournaments where you're on site or even or any, any tournament where you're on site? Because most tournaments are obviously on site with COVID this year. It's not been like that. So. You know, the difference between, obviously, when you won Mythic Championship, you know, Emma runs up, it's the big hugs, it's a great, fun moment, you know, and it's just super, super awesome to see, like, kind of the humanity of it, of people together. Mm -hmm. But in this event, people are obviously apart, still together, you know, watching, but all the casters are in different places, all the players are in different places. How did that feel as far as a tournament experience? Uh, there are, like, a, t a ton of ways in which it feels different. Not all of them are, like, worse, but there are, like, a lot of things... I do miss. Like, one of the big ones is, like, you know, after every single tournament, whether you, like, get crushed or end up winning the tournament or whatever, going out for that meal afterwards with yeah. your friends, either, like, to celebrate or commiserate yeah. or whatever is always just my favorite part of the tournaments for me that final evening. Um, so there is this feeling of, like, anti-climax, I guess. Sure to it uh i it's kind of funny i uh, end up i i'm not used to competing without cards in my hand so i end up shuffling these pokemon cards <laughs> incessantly and they've been completely like destroyed yeah. that's hilarious from me I, shuffling them in my hand i used to do the same thing i used to have a when i used to moto back in the day all day i used to have a deck of magic cards and they looked like worse than your worst revised cards they were so beat up from <laughs> shuffling that's funny um it's also really something people comment a lot is that i emote a lot during my games when i'm playing online mm -hmm. and like when i'm playing in paper i, I have to actively resist because that's just how i am i'm yeah. just like a very emotive person i i, I have to put in so much effort to try and like hold that back when i'm when I'm competing in person. Um, so that's, that's like probably one of the aspects that's actually slightly better for me. 
that I enjoy about the online tournaments. Yeah, I, I mentioned that because it, it was, it's fun to watch. As a viewer, mm -hmm. you know, one of the downsides to Magic viewership in general is you've got two players at a table just staring at each other, you know, playing cards, not <laughs> wanting to give anything away, not wanting to really emote, basically, you know. But when you're watching the webcams, we get to see the players just be themselves. And, you, and it's cool because when we were watching the matches, we get to watch you, and we could see based on your reaction – if something was surprising or not surprising, you know, mm -hmm. a spell got countered. Did you look like plus or non plus? You know, so it, it's kind of cool to to follow along with your thought process. We can almost like hear you talking to us about the game mm -hmm. through your 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 mannerisms, and like you don't get that in a paper match tournament where you're actually at the table. So definitely, I, I see what you can mean where it's a plus and a minus. It it's a cool benefit in that respect, but it, it's also kind of stinks to not be with people and like yeah you know, the, the, the after just the everything you know you lose take a take a bad loss go see your friends and play gin rummy or whatever or you whatever it is you know things that you do between rounds after tournaments that that the end of the day just like going out to eat and, and having a drink is like for sure one of the best parts too so i definitely totally i feel that as well it's kind of a cliche at this point or beyond cliche but uh i'm very much one of the the believers in like you know it's the gathering first and the magic second Sure. <laughs> I, I I feel that, and I miss that a lot. You know, this has been the this has been the, a six month stretch of my life where I've been on Long Island for six months straight, and I have mm. not left. You know, and I'm so used to traveling for the last decade. You know, whether I'm going to a, a pro tour qualifier or as a tournament or whatever it is, SG event. You know, I'm just constantly somewhere in a car going somewhere. It's been a different experience for sure. Mm -hmm. Cool. So we have some questions from my my subscribers. We got five of them here. Is that, is that cool to one of that? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So first one is from One Beardy Boy. And One Beardy Boy says, how do you get a good read on what's going on in your opponent's hand? So kind of one of the things the commentators were talking about a lot that we're talking about a lot when you're watching you play is that you're really, really good at kind of just mm -hmm. ascertaining what your opponent has, playing around it, kind of, you know, the commentators kept saying that you could just see the hand anyway. You know, where we can see it as the viewers, you can kind of just see it too. So what 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 do you think that makes you makes you excel at that? Uh, am I going to get told off if I shout <laughs> if I quickly shout out an article I wrote for a competing website, the one you write for? That's it. Show's <laughs> over. Everyone go. Of, of course, yeah, that, that's great. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, I can give a brief answer now. But if you want a more in depth one, I wrote an article about a month back called something like competitive magic during the time of quarantine and about a third of the article is addressing specifically this um but a lot of it is you're trying to basically just ask questions repeatedly to build up a mental model and alter it over time so like every single time your opponent does something makes a play uh pauses, whatever, you're like, okay, this is not a thing that makes sense to be in their hand anymore. Like, maybe they play at the free drop that's worse in this matchup in this situation. And you're like, okay, the better free drop can't be in their hand at the moment. And so you cross that off the list. And you're just doing that for everything they do. And you have this model of like, this is what I know isn't in their hand. This is what I think probably isn't in their hand. This is what probably is. And you try and deteriorate the model over time because every single turn they're getting more cards and getting the information's like getting a little bit worse. Mm -hmm. So the model that you used two turns ago isn't going to be like hundred percent reliable now and you have to be aware of that too uh, there's just like a lot of a lot of different stuff going on at once but as i say if you read the article i'm a lot more coherent on this subject and uh it's been posted in chat oh sweet Excellent. and uh, thanks power jack i yeah but, I, I think that the way you describe it though is it it is mm -hmm. you're right it's an extremely complicated thing you're so you're right it's, it's hard mm -hmm. to describe i think that that sort of checklist i've sort of described it like that in the past too where you're all right, you just imagine their deck list and just go through, can they have this card right now? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Can they have this card? And just kind of checklist it down. And then you obviously have to vary it as, as new information comes in. But that idea of a list of kind of checking things off, I think is, is a fairly useful like visual way. Mm -hmm. It's obviously very, very difficult to do. And it's much more complicated than that. Um, but 
Cool. Yeah, that, that's that's definitely check the article out. Of course, it's on Star City, and it reminds me a bit of an article that I wrote on Star City a long time ago. Uh, so my first article is called One Word, where mm. your opponent does something, just ask why, and then mark it off. Yeah. Why they do this? Why they do that? You know, some of them are easy, some of them are hard, but you just keep kind of finding those pieces, pieces of information. You kind of keep itemizing them, sorting them out, and just try and make like you're saying this kind of like spreadsheet in your head of what they can have and not have, which is very difficult. But if it, if it was easy, everyone would do it, right? So. Cool. Yeah, it, it it's very easy to like get lazy and be like, okay, they've played a thing. This has happened. It's my turn. What do I do now? Right. And you're just like accepting the situation that you're now in without like asking how you got there. Right. And that's fine if you're just like casually playing matches online or whatever. But if you're competing, then just as you say, ask why. Right. And it, it, you posted on Twitter um, at the at the end of a tournament a um, thing about how you you think. Which is actually scary for me that you're very happy that you've been playing well and you think you're improving. And I mean, I guess I'm not really playing on tour right now, so it doesn't really scare me. But it's got to scare everyone else because you've obviously been crushing lately. So the fact that you're improving is, is terrifying. Um, but you also posted um, that players have a lot more agency in games than they think they do. And that's like probably the biggest leak. I completely agree. Almost all competitive Magic players, people who say they want to be competitive, people who are competitive, Players have so much agency in every game. There's so many little things people miss, and it's so easy because the game, the way the game is designed, it's so easy to be like, oh, I got a lucky, or oh, I drew a land, or oh, they did this, or they drew a cyborg card, or there's so many e easy ways to shrug it off, and I couldn't agree with you more about the agency in Magic. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it just stretches into so many different avenues. Like, <laughs> I... I... I don't really know how to engage in this subject without going down a long rabbit hole, so sure. we should move that's on. Not, we'll, we'll, we'll keep a tweet line. That's fine. I, I just I wanted to say I, I totally agree with that. So let's go to our, our, our next question. It's from HeatFlash360. And HeatFlash asks, what do you do when you want something other than magic? Like, for example, me, my, my game of choice when I'm not playing magic is StarCraft. Um, I actually mm -hmm. watch more than I play, but typically as someone who plays magic 24-7, you know, I stream and writing articles and YouTube and yada, yada, yada. When it comes to downtime... I'm not going to watch a magic stream usually. I want to watch something else. So I'll watch, I like watching StarCraft tournaments. I play a little StarCraft. It's kind of like my game of choice. What's your game aside from magic that you kind of go to when you want to get away from magic? So there was definitely a few year period where if I wanted to get away from magic, I would probably just end up playing more magic or watching more magic anyway. Uh, yeah. I, the last, the last like couple years, I've been a bit more healthier with that stuff. Um, so this year I've been getting really back into video games mm -hmm. again. Um, I used to play a ton when I was in my teens and then kind of lost interest in my early 20s. But that's been like very renewed and uh, just like exploring and checking things out. I'm not really like super into the whole like take because I've got the magic thing going on. I'm not really interested in like playing a game that's going to take up hundreds and hundreds of hours right. of my time. I kind of want to like jump in, get a good experience, um, enjoy my time with it, and then like a month later move on to something else. So, but yeah, I've, I've been doing a lot of that recently. Um, I'm also like quite into film history and art cinema and stuff like that as well. Sweet. Yeah. I find that when it comes to games, it's almost uh, a relief to be able to just play a game and be like, you know what? I'm not that good at this. <laughs> Whatever, this is fun. You know, I'm a middle yep. StarCraft player. I'm I'm low platinum or whatever, but it's fun. And I, I put some effort into getting better, but I know that I can't put the time in to be really good at this or even attempt to be mm -hmm. really good at it. And that's okay. And that that's very liberating when you're playing Magic all the time. You just have to be really good. Have to be really good. Have to, you know. So it's it's kind of a cool like a bit of a release. Yeah, absolutely. I agree completely. It's, it's nice to just be able to like relax with something and not feel like I have to constantly push myself to be better. Yeah. Cool. All right. Next question is from Pyrojack, one of our moderators. Pyrojack says, you're a two-time English national champion. You won the first Mythic, Champ Mythic Championship. You haven't slowed down with this grand finals finish. What's your next goal? What's your, what are your, what's your big goal in Magic? What are, the, what are your goals? Uh, so I would say the one goal I've had for most of this year now is... So competing in Worlds was one of the best experiences in my life on like multiple levels. And 
you know, a big part of that was I got to spend like a week hanging out with Emma, who's one of my closest friends. Mm. And a big part of that was, you know, Honolulu is unbelievable. (laughs) (laughs) But also a big part of that was the tournament, getting to, you know, compete against the handful of players who'd had the best finishes over the last year, being treated so well at the tournament Mm. by WotC in like a bunch of different ways. The tournament having so much style and flair around it, I, I guess a lot of a lot of hype around it. Mm-hmm. Um, that was that was one of the best experiences of my life. And I remember on the Sunday evening before I was about to, you know, fly back the next morning, standing down by the water, looking over the waves and being like, "Okay, I have to I have to qualify for this again <laughs> somehow." <laughs> For sure. So that that that's the one goal I've had for a while. Like I say a while, only a year or whatever. But sure. I, I don't think that goal's gonna go away anytime soon. Awesome. Alright. What's uh our next question is from Finn Dorsal. And this is a little more specific towards perhaps the finals of this tournament. How do you formulate a plan for when your opponent is playing like main deck cyborg cards? So main deck graph diggers cage. You see that Brad's got it. What's your plan for it? You know, main deck Aether Gust. So you, this is obviously an open deckless tournament, so you get to see the list. So you open the decklist up and you see two main deck Grave Diggers Cage. What's what's your? How do you sort of make a plan for that? Given that your main deck is not really prepared for it. Hmm. So with a deck like, I think it's different if you're if you have a deck with like count spells or discard spells or whatever, where you can, you know, try and bias things with the the hate cards or sideboard cards in mind. With goblins, it's kind of tricky because the games where they don't draw Rafticus Cage, you've kind of just got to play the same way most of the time. Mm-hmm. And the games where you, they do, there's not a huge amount you can actually do about it, game one. Mm-hmm. Um, like, Brad having Rafticus Cage in his deck didn't really change how I play that much. Mm-hmm. Like... You know, in theory, it makes drawing tutoring for a Muxus a bit worse in a, in a spot because he could draw the cage, mm. or it makes like valuing a Snoop higher a bit worse because he could be holding the cage and about to run it out. But in reality, it feels felt to me like it was changing those things by a, such a small percentage if the cage hadn't already been played. Mm-hmm that I was mostly just doing what I would be doing anyway, okay. game one. Um, obviously, once it hits play, things completely change, and you're like, okay, right. well, I'm not matrixing for Muxus ever again. <laughs> but <laughs> Okay, great. And then, last question. This is a, a kind of a double question um, from Lance and of Sonic mm-hmm. Arpika. Including yourself, who's your dream top eight, and what format would be, and what deck are you playing? Who is my dream top eight? Yep. Oh my gosh. Um. So the format would be a throwback format, and it would be Grixis De- fully powered Grixis Delver in Le- era legacy. Okay. <laughs> Like this is already legacy, getting like very pre, niche. Pre-Euro legacy? Yeah, pre-Euro, okay. pre-Pro ban, pre-Death Rite ban. Okay. So, back when back when Death Rite and Pro were at their peak right before mm-hmm. the bans, that would that would be the format. Okay. That's basically the most I've enjoyed any format of Magic. <laughs> uh, I really loved that Delver deck. Mm-hmm. Um, the top eight would be myself... Emma, uh, it's really tricky because, like, a part of me wants to throw a bunch of my friends in there just because seeing the top eight would be really exciting. But a part of me wants to throw a bunch of like the best players ever in there. Sure, yeah, is it like is the best you top know, eight for you, best whoever, top eight for so that I can yeah. play? <laughs> um. I don't, I don't know exactly how to finish that list, but some mix of those. I 
I'd really like to play against Aaron again at um, at that sort of level. I I, I faced Aaron Barrich. She's she's a very good friend of mine, mm-hmm. and we we prepared t- together with Jadeen for a pro tour about a year and a half ago, mm-hmm. and then in like round fifteen, Aaron and I played like the seventy five mirror <laughs> in the tournament, and basically spent the whole whole 40 minute match like joking with each other and being silly and probably annoying whoever was sat next to us (laughs) um and we both we yeah so so getting to face her at that sort of level would be a delight and then probably probably the rest of the top eight would just be a bunch of the best players like javier and people like that so that uh I can I can put myself to the test. Cool. And learn some stuff. Awesome. Um, that's it. That's all I got. Any 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 closing comments? Again, huge huge thank you for coming on. I really really appreciate it. This is very very fortunate for me on on my little goblin show to have have you on to playing goblins. I'm sure, you're exhausted from the weekend or whatever. Any any closing thoughts? Parting comments? Uh, thank you for having me on. First of all. It's like being really fun. Uh, I'm also gonna give a quick shout out to my Twitch stream, which yes, I'm sure someone can shout out and chat for me in a moment. I have your, I have your handle uh, under you on the overlay, so it's automatically awesome. MTG on, on Twitch too, right? Yeah. yeah so yeah. The, the, the 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 Twitch username is the same as as the as the uh, Twitter username, which is under mm-hmm. Autumn's webcam, and of yeah. course someone will put it in, uh, in the chat too. And the other thing is, of course, I write articles for Star City Games every other week. So there will be a Goblins article coming out this week, probably on Friday. Excellent. Excellent. Well, again, Autumn, thank you so much for coming on. Again, chat. Hype and chat, everyone, for Autumn. Second place in the Zenikar Rising Championship. And um, very, very excited to keep watching your career unfold because it's been, it's been great. One of my favorite, favorite, my favorite players to watch. And it's great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jim. And keep on with the great Mog Monday concept. <laughs> Mog Monday every Monday. All right, thanks, Alex. <laughs>